Wow, what a wonderful song. Oh my goodness. Uh, have you been blessed as well? Uh, I hope you've been blessed by that song. Whoever uh, has the recording of that or anything, I would love a copy of that to share. Um, I don't know about you, but I feel very close to the Lord today and on God's Sabbath with you. It's just a little bit before Sabbath here, but I know for you it is Sabbath and we want to, are getting close and we want to just praise God for that music. It really, really brought us into God's throne. Father God in heaven, we want to thank you so much that we can draw near to you. We thank you for the musicians, the singers that just performed, Lord, to your glory. We feel like we have been brought right into your very, very presence. And we feel so honored to be here, Lord. Father, in the next few moments, Lord, as we open up the Bible, I pray that you would speak to our hearts, encourage us, show us that we're living in very, very important times, that like we're not here by accident. You have a special work for us to do. You have called us to go into all the world with your message. And so, Jesus, we're asking now in the next few moments that you would draw near to us. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. I'm Pastor Gary Blanchard, as you know, and I've been a youth pastor for many years, and I work now at the General Conference and I have never been to Dubai, so I hope this will not be my last time. <laughs> so what an honor to be here. I hope I'm not, uh, if there's anything else in the program that I'm missing, I'm, I don't want to jump ahead of anyone. Am I ready to go and share a message? Okay, okay. Well, it's an honor to be with you, even if it's just virtual in Dubai. I just feel so blessed to be with each of you today. So I want to um, begin uh, by just kind of opening up. I have a little PowerPoint for you, so I'm just going to open it to that right now. And uh, hopefully you can see my screen here. Yeah, there we go. And many of you know that our new uh, logo for the Youth Department of the General Conference is I Will Go. It's a personal statement that I will be faithful to follow wherever God sends me to share the message of Jesus, the three angels message. There are some of you listening right now that God is calling you to go over the, overseas to be missionaries for Jesus. Do not delay. It's time to go. Some of you, God is not calling you across the sea. Some of you, God is calling you to go across the street. In other words, to reach locally as a missionary for Jesus. But I want to say to our Seventh-day Adventist dear young people around the world right now that every single one of you is a missionary, whether it's across the sea or across the street. God has a work for you to do in these last days, a very important work of taking his message, his urgent message, and his hopeful message to the world right now. I want to say a special greetings to my associates, uh, Pastor Paco, who oversees public campus ministries, and uh, Pastor Andres Peralta, who oversees our club ministries around the world. Uh, these men want you to know they love you and their hearts are with you, Dubai, and you're, as God is moving on your heart, as God is calling you in a special way. And on their behalf, I want to say happy Sabbath to all of you. And of course, Pastor Ted Wilson also sends his loves to each of you today. You know, um, there are many, many people uh, very, very discouraged right now, going through a lot of concern as we look at the things that are happening in our world. You know, young people, God, this is a very, very, uh, these are very unique times. God, uh, just like Esther, called, God called Esther for such a time as this. Young people, you are being called for such a time as this. The church needs you. God needs you. More importantly, Jesus, the Savior of the world, needs you that others might be saved. Right now in the United States, of course, you know we have an upheaval of elections, and these elections have huge consequences around the world. You know, right now, all of us are worried and concerned around the world about the pandemic of the coronavirus and the things that we're hearing of people's lives being lost. We also see the economy being hugely Im impacted by this virus as well. But even within this pandemic, coronavirus is another pandemic, a pandemic of depression and discouragement and even suicide. Now we know suicide is the second leading killer of young people around the world. In fact, every 40 seconds, a young person takes his life around the world. But what they're telling us now is this is more than quadrupled. I mean, sorry, this is tripled recently in recent months because of the coronavirus. Young people are feeling very isolated, very discouraged. I want to say to you, young people, if you're dealing with depression and discouragement right now, I want you to know something, that you do not have to social distance from Jesus. He is there for you. No matter what you've done or where you've been, he says, whoever comes to me, whoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. Jesus is ready to throw his arms around you and give you strength to the situation that you're dealing with. You may feel isolated and alone, 
but you are not alone. Jesus is with you. And you can draw near to him, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done. You don't have to social distance from Jesus. We're living in a world where many people are dealing with discouragement and depression. Um, we also are dealing with the situation of social justice around the world. You young people know this very, very closely. Um, but I got to say to you, if there was ever a church that needs to speak up, it's the Seventh-day Adventist church, because we have a judgment message, a message beginning in 1844, a judgment has begun in the most holy place. And very soon Jesus is going to come back and there's going to be judgment. All hatred, racism, injustice around the world and violence, all of these things are going to be brought out in the open. And the God of heaven, his judgment is come. Revelation 14 verse 6 is a promise. It's a message that young people need to declare that God's judgment is coming upon the earth. Now is the time for us to repent of our sins. That means to change our minds about the direction that we're going away from God and turn around and turn our eyes upon Jesus in these last days. This is a very, very important message. It's a solemn message. It's a warning message. It's an urgent message. But my dear young friends, it's also a hopeful message because we are being called in these last days to turn our eyes upon Jesus. You know, um, a lot of people, like I mentioned, are downcast and discouraged as they're looking at all the things that are happening around the world today. And maybe you're one of those people. I know that I've found myself in that situation in recent months, being very downcast as I see the things that are happening around the world. You know, what I love about the Bible <laughs> is that the Bible speaks to these issues really clearly. In fact, there's an incredible story in Luke chapter 24. I really challenge you to read it. Uh, today when you have some time. Luke chapter 24. I'll tell you the story just for the sake of time, but it would be good for you to go back and read it. It's so relevant for today. There were two men, they were on their road, to, they were on the road to Emmaus. Emmaus was a, a town about seven miles from Jerusalem. So they were traveling, some people would say between seven and eight miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus, a long, long hike. And the Bible says in Luke 24 that they were very downcast and very, very discouraged because of the things that had happened. They had seen Jesus crucified, and they were hoping Jesus would rise to be the king, and he would rule over the Roman nations, that he would be a, an actual um, a king to rescue them from the Romans. They weren't thinking about a king to rescue them from sin. They were thinking about a king to rescue them from the Romans. And they were very discouraged when they saw Jesus dying. Instead of being encouraged, they were discouraged. They had forgotten that Jesus had promised that he would rise from the dead. And so they thought that was it. Jesus has let us down. And so they were very downcast about the things that were happening in the political world and the things that happened, had happened to Jesus on the cross. Very discouraged. In fact, young people, they were so discouraged that they didn't recognize Jesus as he walked along beside them. It's actually true. The, Jesus had rose, risen from the dead and he was walking along beside them. But you know what? They were so discouraged by current events, they didn't even recognize him. Wow. I wonder if a lot of us find ourselves in that situation, that we're so focused on what the news is telling us and so focused on the bad news around us that we don't see that Jesus is with us, that we're not alone in this situation, that one who has all power, who could defeat death, is with us. There's nothing we have to worry about. My young friends, listen to me carefully, and my older friends as well. If Jesus can overcome death, you don't have a problem in his life that he can't get you through. But we need to realize that he's with us. We're not alone here on this planet. This world might tell us that we're divided and we're isolated. But Jesus says, you know what? Whoever comes to me, I, I will in no wise cast out. And the Bible says that Jesus is Emmanuel. And the name Emmanuel means God with us. You're not alone. Emmanuel is with you. But they were downcast. And Jesus says to them, why are you so downcast? What's, what's bothering you? And it's very interesting how they respond. They were very rude to Jesus. They said, Jesus, they said to him, they said to the stranger, they didn't recognize it was Jesus. They said, where have you been? Have you had your head in the sand like an ostrich? Have you not been paying attention? Are you stupid? What's going on? You're not, are you ignorant? They basically were very rude to Jesus. And don't we see a lot of this same kind of behavior on social media, even by Christians? You know, you know it's not just what we say on social media. It's our attitude and how we treat people. It, and this is how we show um, whether or not we're disciples of Jesus. You know, the Bible says they will know you are my disciples by your love. And this includes social media. You know, when people are downcast and discouraged and their focus is not quite right, they become very 
you know, depressed, but they also become very unkind to one another, not only in their words, but in their attitude and their actions. And this happens. I mean, the Bible in Luke 24 is definitely a story. This story is for us today. But notice what Jesus does. Jesus gives them the solution to anxiety and depression. And he also gives you and I the same solution. I want you to listen to this very carefully. It's in Luke 24, verse 27. Here's a revolutionary passage that can change your life right now if you're feeling these, these same feelings that the disciples were feeling. In Luke 24, verse 27, Jesus gives them the solution. The Bible says, And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Young people, what we need to do in these last days is we must turn our eyes upon Jesus. Jesus turns these men's attention away from the things that are happening in the world, and he turns their attention to to himself. You see, young people, if there was ever a time for us to begin to open up the Bible and study, especially the stories and the teachings of Jesus, it's now. Now is the time to turn our attention upon Christ in these times. Maybe what you need to do is watch a little less Netflix. Uh Uh-oh, starting to meddle here. A little less Netflix and a little more getting into the Bible. Maybe instead of uh, binging on Netflix, we need to be binging on the Word of God. For eight, for three hours, these two men studied the Bible with Jesus, especially those prophecies and those stories about Christ. Young people, if you find yourself discouraged, if you find yourself having a hateful or angry attitude, God is appealing to you here to turn your eyes upon Jesus. If you're feeling discouraged and depressed, turn your eyes upon Jesus. This is the message we must embrace as Seventh Adventist young people, and this is the message we must take to the world. Wow. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. You know, I don't really know um, what passages in the Bible Jesus studied with these disciples for that three-hour hike from Jerusalem to Emmaus. But the Bible says, starting with Moses and all the prophets, he started, and in the Bible, in the scriptures, he pointed them to himself. Maybe he showed them Isaiah 53 and told them about how it was prophesied that he would die on the cross and then rise from the grave. Maybe he took them to Psalm 16, where in the, in the promise, there was a promise that he would rise from the dead. In Psalms 22 or Numbers 21, I don't know all the stories Jesus must have told them, but he built their faith in himself. He turned their attention on himself. And young people, what we need more than ever, whether you're young or old today, is a turning of our hearts to Jesus, studying those prophecies in the Bible that point to Jesus, studying those stories in the Bible, in the Old Testament, the New Testament, that lift up Jesus. Maybe it's time for us to open up the book Desire of Ages by Ellen White and begin to study about Jesus and get our eyes upon Christ to turn our eyes upon him. You know, I don't know if you've ever heard of Peter Serubi. Peter Serubi was the man who played Barabbas in the, in the movie, The Passion, that was, you know, put together by um, Mel Gibson. How many of you have seen that? Maybe if you raise your hand, I can see that you saw the movie. It's a pretty amazing movie uh, by Mel Gibson. But Peter Serubi, this man here in, your, in the picture uh, who played Barabbas, he was not really a strong uh, believer at all. It may be, maybe nominally, but he actually studied to be a Tibetan monk for many years. So he was, he was really not even a convert. And he actually did not want to play the part of Barabbas. He wanted to play the part of Peter because it was a bigger part. And he felt he was he was the man for the job. He had all these talents and stuff and he should play that. But Mel Gibson said, no, I want you to play Barabbas. I already have somebody to play play Peter. But he but but Mel Gibson says said to the the actor, he said, listen, I want you to do me a favor, though. Throughout the entire uh, filming of this movie, I do not want you to look at Jesus at all. I don't want you to see the character that's playing Jesus. I don't want you to look at all at him entire, the entire time. I want you to stay clear. The only time I want, to, I want you to look at Jesus is at this part. When, when, it's, when Jesus is dying in your place and you are being released, then that's the first time I want you to look. And pre, Peter Serubi tells the story about how that time came right here. You can see the picture. This is the first time in the picture that he's actually looking at Jesus in the movie. And actually, um, he says in his testimony that it was at that moment when he turned his eyes and he looked 
and he saw Jesus and he suddenly realized that Jesus had taken the judgment of God upon Calvary in his place. That Jesus had, had faced death, tasted death, tasted hell, tasted God's wrath against sin, tasted God's judgment against sin for him. And when he made that look and he saw in a flash, his life was changed and he realized what Christ had done for him. In just a moment, in turning his eyes upon Jesus, his life was radically changed. You can read his testimony. It's incredible what God was able to do in Peter Serubi's life with just one look at Jesus. My dear young friends, this is what God is telling you today. It is time for us to turn our eyes upon Jesus. And notice what will happen. Don't you love that song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus? I mean, that's one of my favorite songs. I would say right now, it's probably the most relevant song on the planet. In other words, it is the most important song on the planet right now as we're being distracted by all the terrible things around us. Listen to what this song says. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And notice the promise. And the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. Young people, this is the most important thing I could tell you from the General Conference Youth Department. In these crazy times that we're living in, it's time for us to turn our eyes upon Jesus like never before, to study him in the Bible, to use the time where we're not in school or not at work, to use that time to really draw closer to Jesus. You don't have to social distance from him, to turn our eyes upon him. Maybe you guys knew this, but Helen Howroth Lemel was the woman who um, wrote the song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Uh, it's amazing that when she wrote this song, she was actually going blind. Not only that, when she wrote the song, her husband had just abandoned her because he didn't like the fact that she was blind. She had met him uh, and they had been married for a few years, but then when her eyesight left him, left her, she, uh, he abandoned her. And here she was in an incredible crisis that most people would have been discouraged and just given up. Maybe some of you are being tempted and you're discouraged, you're ready to give up. There might be somebody listening right now who has a broken heart like she did. Some, maybe your boyfriend or maybe your husband has, has abandoned you or your wife or your girlfriend. You're going through a broken heart right now. Listen, I'm telling you to turn your eyes upon Jesus. Helen, in that, in that situation in her life, maybe you, some of you are going through some kind of a sickness or, or disease and you're so very discouraged. Well, this song is for you then. Turn your eyes upon Jesus and the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. My young people, God is calling us in these last days to turn our eyes upon him so that we can go out and turn others and help others turn their eyes upon Jesus in this crisis. Now, the story doesn't end here. I love this. I want to share with you. Here's what some four amazing things that happened to these two disciples during that walk with Jesus as he turns their eyes upon him. Four amazing things, young people. Watch the, the first thing that happened while these two men were turning their eyes upon Jesus in the scriptures. The Bible says their eyes were opened and they suddenly realized that Jesus was with them. Wow. <laughs> you know, as we study Jesus in scripture, as we look for Jesus in the stories and his teachings in the Bible, all of a sudden what will happen is you will begin to realize that you are not alone, that the mighty God of the universe, the creator, is with you. Your eyes will be opened. This is so amazing. The Bible says their eyes were opened and they realized Jesus was with them. That's a miracle. You will suddenly realize that you're not alone in these times, young people, no matter what you're going through or what your family might be going through. The second thing that happened to them is the Bible says their hearts. They said, oh my goodness, our hearts are, were burning within us while we were walking with them. You see, they were, they were experiencing emotional healing. Some people think if you believe in Jesus or if you focus on Jesus, you'll only get spiritual healing. And that's true. You get forgiveness for your sins and eternal life. You get to be right standing with God because of what Jesus did for you on the cross. These are beautiful things. But don't ever forget this. Jesus still heals emotionally today. Maybe you're brokenhearted and discouraged in your heart. Notice what happens. As you turn your eyes upon Jesus, you experience emotional healing. They said, we're not our hearts burning within us. You know, they were experiencing revival. Young people, this world is getting cold. But if we turn our eyes upon Jesus, our hearts will stand, stay warm in love. 
We'll experience emotional healing. We'll experience revival. And rather than our hearts getting more hateful, our hearts will get more full of love for others, no matter what they've done to us or what, they, or what we perceive they've done to us. You see, God is calling this church. God is calling young people. Don't get colder like the world. Get warmer. Wow. That's amazing. And if we would turn our hearts upon Jesus, he would heal us. He would give us warm hearts. He would pour love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, like it says in Romans 5, 5. The third thing that happened, Jesus doesn't just heal us emotionally. Jesus heals us physically. Wow. Maybe some of you guys remember that story when the Israelites were marching in, in, in the desert. And you remember the snakes came out and began to bite them. You remember they cried out to God and God told Moses to set up a pole. And on that pole, they were to put a serpent. And if they would look at that pole, which is a symbol of Jesus, they would be healed physically. Jesus still heals today, young people. And as we turn our focus on him, not only do we experience spiritual and emotional healing, but physical healing. But you say, Pastor Gary, how do I know there's physical healing in this story? Well, notice what happened. After these guys looked at Jesus, their bodies were healed. They were energized, and they had just walked eight miles. Now the Bible says they turned around, and they were so excited because they had encountered Jesus that they ran back eight miles. Physical healing and energy was given to them. By the way, you guys have heard of the term enthusiasm, right? Enthusiasm means in God. (laughs) <laughs> they were experiencing enthusiasm. They had experienced Jesus. They had encountered Jesus by turning their eyes away from the world and the wickedness and the evil they saw around them and focusing on Jesus for that three hours. They experienced incredible supernatural healing and energy. Maybe there's some of you listening right now that need to be physically healed. Maybe you have, some of you have the coronavirus, or maybe some of you have some other ailment that you have. Wow. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Watch what Jesus can do. He still heals today. And finally, young people, they were given a brand new purpose. They didn't just run back to Jerusalem. They went, ran back with Jerusalem with a testimony. You see, a lot of people want to tell others about their love for Christ, but they don't know Jesus. It's very difficult to be involved as a missionary, whether it's across the sea or across the street. It's very difficult if you've never seen Jesus. But if you turn your eyes upon him, you will have a testimony You will have something to share about what Jesus has revealed about himself in the Bible, what Jesus has revealed to you personally. Look, there's a lot of testimonies. You can tell all kinds of testimonies about other people, but when you've encountered Jesus for yourself, because you spent three hours or an hour or two hours with Jesus, when you can share what he's told you, what he's taught you, what he's shown you, whoa, there's power in that, incredible power in that. And this is what happened. They went back and they told others what had happened to them, what had personally happened to them. This is the miracle. This is the supernatural thing that happens when we turn upon eyes upon Jesus. The things of this earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. We begin to understand how beautiful Jesus is. We begin to understand about his grace, his undeserved kindness toward us. That's what grace is. Grace sounds like a, you know, a pastoral word, but it's very simple. Grace means undeserved kindness. As we study the life of Jesus and realize that he's a friend of sinners, he died for the sinful human race. He died for you. He died for me. When you realize that, you realize his grace, all of a sudden your life has changed, especially when you realize he died for you. He's a personal savior. Jesus didn't just die for your pastor and your friends and the elders and every, your parents. He died specifically for you. And if you were the only person, he would have died for you. And as you study the Bible and you study Jesus and you realize his love for you, oh my, (laughs) you you have a message. Come on now. You have a great message to tell others. You know, young people, we have a brand new logo for the youth department. It's I will go. And it's also the logo for the world church, by the way. But you notice that for the youth department, we had to be a little bit rebellious. So we came up with a brighter, (laughs) we have a brighter logo than everybody else. It's the bright blue or bright red or bright yellow. It's a beautiful, beautiful logo. But this is the same logo for the world church, but it's a little brighter, but it's I will go. Now, what I love about this logo is that there's an arrow in the middle of it. You see the arrow? I hope you can see that arrow. Now, what you don't, what a lot of people don't realize is an arrow is the universal or biblical symbol for youth. I'm going to prove it to you. Watch this. In Psalms 127, verse 4, it says, like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. 
You see, so right at the very center of the World Church logo is a symbol of young people. Young people, God is calling you to go like an arrow. He is calling you to live dangerously for him, but to take the message of hope to the world. Young people, the message is very simple. It's this, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. God is calling you young people to fly fast and to live dangerously for him. Notice, and we're, you're not just arrows, you're arrows in the hands of a warrior. In other words, you were not designed for target practice, young people. You were, not ta- you were not designed for games. You were designed to go dangerously, to be sent by a warrior into the enemy's front lines, to go into those places, whether it's across the street or across the sea, with the good news of what Jesus has done for you. You are to go dangerously into the world. You know, young people, I'm here in the church today because when I was two years old, a young couple, a young Seventh-day Adventist couple decide, decided to cross the street and lead my parents to Jesus. My parents became Seventh-day Adventist because this young couple shared with my par- parents not only the doctrines of our church, which are so, so very important, especially as they highlight Jesus more and more, but they came and they told my parents what Jesus had done for them personally. They had had an encounter with Jesus. They had turned their eyes upon Jesus themselves. Then they went to my parents and told my parents to do the same. That's what it's about. To be a missionary, you must first turn your eyes upon Jesus and then go and tell others what he has done for you that they might turn their eyes upon him too and experience his emotional, physical, spiritual healing and the purpose he gives to the human life. You know, all of our adventures are arrows. If you're an adventurer right right now, you are God's arrow. If you are a pathfinder, you are God's arrow. If you're an ambassador, you are God's arrow. If you're a young person between the ages of 18 and 30, you are God's arrow. If you're a public campus ministry student, you are God's arrow. If you are a born-again Christian who has received Jesus as your Savior, you are an arrow. I don't care what age you are. By the way, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is not about ageism. You know what ageism is? Ageism says, you know what, if you're old, only old people can work for God. No. And ageism also says only young people can work for God. No. No. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is a phenomenal church because the Seventh-day Adventist Church believes in intergenerational ministry. All of us are called to go across the sea or across the street with the wonderful news about Jesus, turning their eyes upon him. You know, in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, in in the youth department, we have four areas that we're sending young people into like, like arrows. We're sending them into the churches, into the campuses, into the cities, and into the unreached countries of the world. You can see the little, little uh, symbol I have on the screen here. You'll notice off to the side, you'll see all the ministries that we have at the general conference that helps to reach those target areas. You know, like maybe some of you have heard of i We're challenging young people to start i pro- programs in their local churches, to work with their elders and pastors to start an i pro- program. i means intergenerational churches of refuge. This means this is a, a ministry where we help local churches, where young, help local churches can be places where all ages work together to reach their communities for Christ, i Some of you have heard of public campus ministries. We challenge young people to be involved in public campus ministries. You know, I got to say to all of our local churches listening, if you have a university close by, you have a responsibility to reach that local university. Public campus ministries can help you. Starting a public campus ministries so that you can help and reach out to those young people and also help them get connected with their local church. There's a whole lot of others that we can use for each of these, but I'm just touching on a few. Some of you know that very soon in March, we have Global Youth Day. I hope every single local church listening right now is involved in Global Youth Day. This is the first step in reaching your community. Global Youth Day this year, we have a simple theme, uh, reaching out to different colors, cultures, and communities. This means then that if, you're, if you have a different culture or color or community right around your local church or near your home or near your dorm room, then we're challenging you to start praying, God, show me how to reach out in love and compassion to people that are different than I am. That's something the world cannot teach. Only the church can teach that because God's love is poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Global Youth Day is about reaching people of different colors, cultures, and communities than yourself. Global Youth Day is a great opportunity. One year in mission. 
My goodness, I hope every single union around the world has at least a one, at least one year admission. That means where young people can spend a year if they want to, taking a break from school or whatever else, just to focus on reaching a, a particular city with the Three Angels message. That's one year admission for the cities. And also we have one year admission for the unreached countries of the world. Young people, you are arrows of hope into this world, urgent arrows. You got to go fast like an arrow. Boom. You got to live dangerously for God, whether it's across the sea or across the street. Go quickly. I will go with the wonderful news of what Jesus has. Jesus has changed your life and how he wants to change their life. We are sent to go to the churches and campuses and cities and countries. You know, maybe, maybe your local church or your local union or conference has another ministry. Maybe it's not i or maybe it's something else, or maybe it's not, uh, you know, one-year mission. Maybe it's something else like that, where young people can spend a year out just being missionaries for God. Whatever it is that your church is doing or your local conference is doing to go, get involved. Come on, get involved. We are in epic times. We are living at the very end of earth's history. We must go, young people, and God is calling you to go like arrows. I want to end with this story. And I want to thank you again for what an incredible privilege of, of being able to speak to you got young people. But there's a wonderful story a friend of mine told me many years ago. I've never forgotten it. I've shared it around the world. Maybe you've heard it. <laughs> Forgive me, you have to hear it again. <laughs> but it's a great story about um, a man who was tra traveling to church with his family one Sabbath. And uh, as they were heading to church, they looked and they saw a horrible sight in the middle of a, the highway was a, 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 f a little family of ducks. The mother and father had been run over, a couple other baby ducks had been run over, and there was like five or six of them still alive, scared to death. They didn't know what to do in the middle of the street. My friend pulled over his car really quickly, uh, grabbed a box from the back of his, his uh, car, um, and looked both ways, of course, and when it was safe, he ran out and he scooped as many of these little ducks into the box to try to save them as he could, so he could get them away from there into a safe place. And all the ducks, but one of them, got inside the box. He couldn't catch the other duck. In fact, the other duck ran across the other side of the street and went into the woods. And my friend was very concerned at this point because now he was even graver danger because there was all kinds of predators out there in the woods as well. So he went back and he put all the ducks back in the car and then he went out to try to find the other duck that had crossed the street into the woods. He began to make all kinds of quacking sound, quack, 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 trying to get that duck but the duck would go, would run away from him and went further and further into the woods. And he's like, what am I gonna do? Then he had an idea. He ran back to the car and he got the little duck's sister, one of his little sisters, picked her up and carried her across the street. And she began to quack, 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 quack as, she, as he went into the woods. And you wouldn't believe this true story. My friend told me that while she was quacking, her little brother heard his sister quacking turned around <laughs> and he came right back and he was able to rescue the little brother and take him back. And he told me, he said, Gary, it brings me tears in my eyes when I suddenly realized what had just happened. He said, Gary, God has been doing this for centuries, crying out to the human race, come back to me. I love you. I want to save you. But they run further and further away. Even after he sent his son, Jesus, to show them what God is like, they still run away from him. But God had a plan. It's called Seventh-day Adventist Young People. <laughs> little, little ducks. You and I are little ducks. And he sends us out like arrows. And as we begin to speak the language of Jesus to others and tell them what Jesus has done for us personally because we turned our eyes upon him and they, how much he loves them, then they will turn. And because of our testimony of what he's done for us personally, they will turn and come back and God can rescue them through us. Oh my, that's incredible purpose. Young people, God has sent you like ambassadors. The Bible says you are sent like ambassadors to plead in God's behalf that others would return to him. They're running from God, but they won't run from you because you are his representatives in the world and you're one of them. You're one of them. And as you go like an arrow into those dangerous places for Jesus, because you said, I will go these next five years, wherever God wants to send me, I will go and tell the world how much the Lord loves them and what he's done for me. Young people, we must go urgently, we must go fast, because I believe personally that we truly are living at the very end of verse history. 
And even now, many young people are running further and further away from God. We must go quickly. We must go to them. And only you can reach them in your universities, in your schools, at your work, in your families. Some of you are living in areas that are past the 10, um, out of the, um, in areas where it's a little bit dangerous to be a Christian. God has sent you there dangerously for him to, to be wise as a serpent. Don't get me wrong. We are to live dangerously, but we are to be, like Jesus said, wise as serpents and as gentle as doves. What does that mean? We must have the character of Jesus. That's like a dove, but we must be strategic and very wise like a serpent is, but we must go. So young people, on behalf of the General Conference Youth Department, we love you guys and happy Sabbath. Let me pray for you. Father, Lord, you are the one above the storm. And Lord, you are calling us to yourself. We thank you, Jesus. We turn our eyes upon you these last few minutes. But now, Lord, throughout this week, may we make the time to walk with you as in a way from Jerusalem to Emmaus and let you help us understand the scriptures, Lord, and understand those passages about you and turn our eyes upon you, Jesus. We thank you for your healing, physical, emotional, and spiritual. We love you, Lord. Bless your young people. Bless your leaders. I know there's a lot of leaders listening right now and pastors and administrators and parents, teachers. Thank you for them, Lord. Bless our young arrows in Jesus' name. Amen.